Chapter 2. The Gods of Egypt, Part 1. The incredible number of religious scenes to be found among the representations on the ancient monuments of Egypt is, at first glance, very striking. Nearly every illustration in the works of Egyptologists brings before us the figure of some deity receiving, with an impassive countenance, the prayers and offerings of a worshipper. One would think that the country had been inhabited for the most part by gods, and contained just sufficient men and animals to satisfy the requirements of their worship. On penetrating into this mysterious world, we are confronted by an actual rabble of gods, each one of whom has always possessed but a limited and almost unconscious existence. They severally represented a function, a moment in the life of man or of the universe. Thus, Naprit was identified with the ripe ear or the grain of wheat. Mashkanit appeared by the child's cradle at the very moment of its birth, and Raninit presided over the naming and the nature of the newly born. Neither Raninit, the fairy godmother, nor Mashkanit exercised over nature as a whole that sovereign authority which we are accustomed to consider the primary attribute of deity. Every day of every year was passed by the one in easing the pangs of women in travail, by the other in choosing for each baby a name of an auspicious sound, and one which would afterwards serve to exercise the influence of evil fortune. No sooner were their tasks accomplished in one place than they hastened to another, where approaching birth demanded their presence and their care. From childbed to childbed they passed, and if they fulfilled the single offices in which they were accounted adepts, the pious asked nothing more of them. Bands of mysterious Sinocelephi, haunting the eastern and the western mountains, concentrated the whole of their activity on one passing moment of the day. They danced and chattered in the east for half an hour, to salute the sun at his rising, even as others in the west hailed him on his entrance into night. It was the duty of a certain genie to open the gates in Hades, or to keep the paths daily traversed by the sun. These genie were always at their posts, never free to leave them, and possessed no other faculty than that of punctually fulfilling their appointed offices. Their existence, generally unperceived, was suddenly revealed at the very moment when the specific acts of their lives were on the point of accomplishment. These being completed, the divinities fell back into their state of inertia, and were, so to speak, reabsorbed by their functions until the next occasion. Scarcely visible even by glimpses, they were not easily depicted, their real forms being often unknown, these were approximately conjectured from their occupations. The character and costume of an archer, or of a spearman, were ascribed to such as roamed through Hades, to pierce the dead with arrows or with javelins. Those who prowled around souls to cut their throats and hack them to pieces were represented as women armed with knives, carvers, dunit, or else as lacerators, nokit. Some appeared in human form, others as animals, bulls or lions, rams or monkeys, serpents, fish, ibises, hawks. Others dwelt in inanimate things, such as trees, sistrums, stakes stuck in the ground, and lastly, many betrayed a mixed origin in their combinations of human and animal forms. These latter would be regarded by us as monsters. To the Egyptians they were beings, rarer perhaps than the rest, but not the less real, and their like might be encountered in the neighborhood of Egypt. How could men who believed themselves surrounded by sphinxes and griffins of flesh and blood doubt that there were bull-headed and hawk-headed divinities with human busts? The existence of such paradoxical creatures was proved by much authentic testimony. More than one hunter had distinctly seen them as they ran along the furthest plains of the horizon, beyond the herds of gazelles of which he was in chase, and shepherds dreaded them for their flocks as truly as they dreaded lions, or the great felice of the desert. This nation of gods, like nations of men, contained foreign elements, the origin of which was known to the Egyptians themselves. They knew that Hathor, the milch cow, had taken up her abode in their land from very ancient times, and they called her the Lady of Puanit, after the name of her native country. Bisu had followed her in course of time, and claimed his share of honors and worship along with her. He first appeared as a leopard, then he became a man clothed in a leopard's skin, but of strange countenance and alarming character, a big-headed dwarf with high cheekbones and a wide and open mouth, whence hung an enormous tongue. He was at once jovial and martial, a friend of the dance and of battle. In historic times all nations subjugated by the pharaohs transferred some of their principal divinities to their conquerors, 
and the Libyan Shahididi was enthroned in the valley of the Nile, in the same way as the Semitic Baalu, and his retinue of Astartes, Anitis, Etchefs, and Kadshus. These divine colonists fared like all foreigners who have sought to settle on the banks of the Nile. They were promptly assimilated, wrought, moulded, and made into Egyptian deities scarcely distinguishable from those of their old race. This mixed pantheon had its grades of nobles, princes, kings, and each of its members was representative of one of the elements constituting the world, or of one of the forces which regulated its government. The sky, the earth, the stars, the sun, the Nile, were so many breathing and thinking beings, whose lives were daily manifest in the life of the universe. They were worshipped from one end of the valley to the other, and the whole nation agreed in proclaiming their sovereign power. But when the people began to name them, to define their powers and attributes, to particularize their forms, or the relationships that subsisted among them, this unanimity was at an end. Each principality, each num, each city, almost every village, conceived and represented them differently. Some said that the sky was the great Horus, Heroerus, the sparrow-hawk of mottled plumage which hovers in highest air, and whose gaze embraces the whole field of creation. Owing to a punning assonance between his name and the word Horu, which designates the human countenance, the two senses were combined, and to the idea of the sparrow-hawk there was added that of a defined face, whose two eyes opened in turn, the right eye being the sun, to give light by day, and the left eye the moon, to illuminate the night. The face shone also with a light of its own, the zodiacal light, which appeared unexpectedly, morning or evening, a little before sunrise and a little after sunset. These luminous beams, radiating from a common center, hidden in the heights of the firmament, spread into a wide pyramidal sheet of liquid blue, whose base rested upon the earth, but whose apex was slightly inclined towards the zenith. The divine face was symmetrically framed, and attached to earth by four thick locks of hair. These were the pillars which upbore the firmament and prevented its falling into ruin. A no less ancient tradition disregarded as fabulous all tales told of the sparrow-hawk, or of the face, and taught that heaven and earth are wedded gods, Sibu and Nuit, from whose marriage came forth all that has been, all that is, and all that shall be. Most people invested them with human form, and represented the earth god Sibu as extended beneath Nuit, the starry one. The goddess stretched out her arms, stretched out her slender legs, stretched out her body above the clouds, and her disheveled head drooped westward. But there were also many who believed that Sibu was concealed under the form of a colossal gander, whose mate once laid the sun egg, and perhaps still laid it daily. From the piercing cries wherewith he congratulated her, and announced the good news to all who cared to hear it, after the manner of his kind, he had received the flattering epithet of Nagugu Ori, the great cackler. Other versions repudiated the goose in favor of a vigorous bull, the father of gods and men, whose companion was a cow, a large-eyed Hathor, of beautiful countenance. The head of the good beast rises into the heavens, the mysterious waters which cover the world flow along her spine, the star-covered underside of her body, which we call the firmament, is visible to the inhabitants of earth, and her four legs are the four pillars standing at the four cardinal points of the world. The planets, and especially the sun, varied in form and nature according to the prevailing conception of the heavens. The fiery disk, Atonu, by which the sun revealed himself to men, was a living god, called Ra, as was also the planet itself. Where the sky was regarded as Horus, Ra formed the right eye of the divine face. When Horus opened his eyelids in the morning, he made the dawn and the day. When he closed them in the evening, the dusk and night were at hand. Where the sky was looked upon as the incarnation of a goddess, Ra was considered as her son, his father being the earth god, and he was born again with every new dawn, wearing a sidelock, and with his finger to his lips as human children were conventionally represented. He was also that luminous egg, laid and hatched in the east by the celestial goose, from which the sun breaks forth to fill the world with its rays. Nevertheless, by an anomaly not uncommon in religions, the egg did not always contain the same kind of bird. A lapwing or a heron might come out of it, or perhaps in memory of Horus, one of the beautiful golden sparrow-hawks of southern Egypt. A sun-hawk, 
hovering in high heaven on outspread wings, at least represented a bold and poetic image, but what can be said for a sun-calf? Yet it is under the innocent aspect of a spotted calf, a suckling calf of pure mouth, that the Egyptians were pleased to describe the sun-god when Sibu, the father, was a bull, and Hathor a heifer. But the prevalent conception was that in which the life of the sun was likened to the life of a man. The two deities presiding over the east received the orb upon their hands at its birth, just as midwives receive a newborn child, and cared for it during the first hour of the day and of its life. It soon left them, and proceeded under the belly of Nuit, growing and strengthening from minute to minute, until at noon it had become a triumphant hero whose splendor is shed abroad over all. But as night comes on, his strength forsakes him, and his glory is obscured, he is bent and broken down, and heavily drags himself along like an old man leaning upon his stick. At length he passes away beyond the horizon, plunging westward into the mouth of Nuit, and transversing her body by night to be born anew the next morning, again to follow the paths along which he had travelled on the preceding day. A first bark, the Saktit, awaited him at his birth, and carried him from the eastern to the southern extremity of the world. Mazit, the second bark, received him at noon, and bore him into the land of Manu, which is at the entrance to Hades. Other barks, with which we are less familiar, conveyed him by night, from his setting until his rising at morn. Sometimes he was supposed to enter the barks alone, and then they were magic and self-directed, having neither oars nor sails nor helm. Sometimes they were equipped with a full crew, like that of an Egyptian boat, a pilot at the prow to take soundings in the channel and forecast the wind, a pilot astern to steer, a quartermaster in the midst to transmit the orders of the pilot at the prow to the pilot at the stern, and half a dozen sailors to handle poles or oars. Peacefully the bark glided along the celestial river, amid the acclamations of the gods who dwelt upon its shores. But occasionally a poppy, a gigantic serpent, like that which hides within the earthly Nile and devours its banks, came forth from the depths of the waters and arose in the path of the god. As soon as they caught sight of it in the distance, the crew flew to arms, and entered upon the struggle against him with prayers and spear-thrusts. Men in their cities saw the sun faint and fail, and sought to succor him in his distress. They cried aloud, they were beside themselves with excitement, beating their breasts, sounding their instruments of music, and striking with all their strength upon every metal vase or utensil in their possession, that their clamor might rise to heaven and terrify the monster. After a time of anguish, Ra emerged from the darkness and again went on his way, while Apopi sank back into the abyss, paralyzed by the magic of the gods, and pierced with many a wound. Apart from these temporary eclipses, which no one could foretell, the Sun King steadily followed his course round the world, according to laws which even his will could not change. Day after day he made his oblique ascent from east to south, thence to descend obliquely towards the west. During the summer months the obliquity of his course diminished, and he came closer to Egypt. During the winter it increased, and he went farther away. This double movement recurred with such regularity from equinox to solstice, and from solstice to equinox, that the day of the god's departure and the day of his return could be confidently predicted. The Egyptians explained this phenomenon according to their conceptions of the nature of the world. The solar bark always kept close to that bank of the celestial river which was nearest to men, and when the river overflowed at the annual inundation, the sun was carried along with it outside the regular bed of the stream, and brought yet closer to Egypt. As the inundation abated, the bark descended and receded, its great distance from earth corresponding with the lowest level of the waters. It was again brought back to us by the rising strength of the next flood, and as this phenomenon was yearly repeated, the periodicity of the sun's oblique movements was regarded as the necessary consequence of the periodic movements of the celestial Nile. End of Section 9 Chapter 2 The Gods of Egypt Part 2 the same stream also carried a whole crowd of gods, whose existence was revealed at night only to the inhabitants of earth. At an interval of twelve hours, and in its own bark, the pale disk of the moon, Yauhu Ahuhu, Yauhu Ahuhu, followed the disk of the sun along the ramparts of the world. The moon also appeared in many various forms, here as a man born of Niut, there as a cynocephalus or an ibis, 
Elsewhere it was the left eye of Horus, guarded by the Ibis or Cynocephalus. Like Ra, it had its enemies incessantly upon the watch for it, the crocodile, the hippopotamus, and the sow. But it was when at the full, about the fifteenth of each month, that the lunar eye was in greatest peril. The sow fell upon it, tore it out of the face of heaven, and cast it, streaming with blood and tears, into the celestial Nile, where it was gradually extinguished, and lost for days. But its twin, the sun, or its guardian, the Cenocephalus, immediately set forth to find it and to restore it to Horus. No sooner was it replaced than it slowly recovered, and renewed its radiance. When it was well, Uzait, the sow again attacked and mutilated it, and the gods rescued and again revived it. Each month there was a fortnight of youth and growing splendor, followed by a fortnight's agony and ever-increasing pallor. It was born to die, and died to be born again twelve times in the year, and each of these cycles measured a month for the inhabitants of the world. One invariable accident from time to time disturbed the routine of its existence. Profiting by some distraction of the guardians, the sow greedily swallowed it, and then its light went out suddenly, instead of fading gradually. These eclipses, which alarmed mankind at least as much as did those of the sun, were scarcely more than momentary, the gods compelling the monster to cast up the eye before it had been destroyed. Every evening the lunar bark issued out of Hades by the door which Ra had passed through in the morning, and as it rose on the horizon, the star lamps scattered over the firmament appeared one by one, giving light here and there like the campfires of a distant army. However many of them there might be, there were as many indestructibles, Akhihmu Soku, or unchanging ones, Akhihmu Urdu, whose charge it was to attend upon them and watch over their maintenance. They were not scattered at random by the hand which had suspended them, but their distribution had been ordered in accordance with a certain plan, and they were arranged in fixed groups like so many star republics, each being independent of its neighbors. They represented the outlines of bodies of men and animals dimly traced out upon the depths of night, but shining with greater brilliancy in certain important places. The seven stars which we liken to a chariot, Charles's Wain, suggested to the Egyptians the haunch of an ox placed on the northern edge of the horizon. Two lesser stars connected the haunch, Mashkhayet, with thirteen others, which recalled the silhouette of a female hippopotamus, Ririt, erect upon her hind legs, and jauntily carrying upon her shoulders a monstrous crocodile, whose jaws opened threateningly above her head. Eighteen luminaries of varying size and splendor, forming a group hard by the hippopotamus, indicated the outline of a gigantic lion couchant, with stiffened tail, its head turned to the right and facing the haunch. The lion is sometimes shown as having a crocodile's tail. According to Bio, the Egyptian lion has nothing in common with the Greek constellation of that name, nor yet with our own, but was composed of smaller stars, belonging to the Greek constellation of the cup, or to the continuation of the hydra, so that its head, its body, and its tail would follow the hydra, or of the virgin. Most of the constellations never left the sky. Night after night they were to be found almost in the same places, and always shining with the same even light. Others, borne by a slow movement, passed annually beyond the limits of sight for months at a time. Five at least of our planets were known from all antiquity, and their characteristic colors and appearance carefully noted. Sometimes each was thought to be a hawk-headed Horus, Uapshetuti, our Jupiter, Kahiri, Saturn, Sobku, Mercury, steered their bark straight ahead, like Iahu and Ra, but Mars Doshiri, the red, sailed backwards. As a star, Bonu, the bird, Venus, had a dual personality. In the evening it was Uati, the lonely star which is the first to rise, often before nightfall. In the morning it became Tianuturi, the god who hails the sun before his rising, and proclaims the dawn of day. Sahu and Sopdit, Orion and Sirius, were the rulers of this mysterious world. Sahu consisted of fifteen stars, seven large and eight small, so arranged as to represent a runner darting through space, while the fairest of them shone above his head, and marked him out from afar to the admiration of mortals. With his right hand he flourished the crux ansada, and turning his head towards Sothis, as he beckoned her on with his left, 
seemed as though inviting her to follow him. The goddess, standing scepter in hand, and crowned with a diadem of tall feathers surmounted by her most radiant star, answered the call of Sahu with a gesture, and quietly embarked in pursuit as though in no anxiety to overtake him. Sometimes she is represented as a cow lying down in her bark, with tree stars along her back, and Sirius flaming from between her horns. Not content to shine by night only, her bluish rays suddenly darted forth in full daylight and without any warning, often described upon the sky the mystic lines of the triangle which stood for her name. It was then that she produced those curious phenomena of the zodiacal light which other legends attributed to Horus himself. One, and perhaps the most ancient of the innumerable accounts of this god and goddess, represented Sahu as a wild hunter. A world as vast as ours rested upon the other side of the iron firmament. Like ours, it was distributed into seas, and continents divided by rivers and canals, but peopled by races unknown to men. Sahu traversed it during the day, surrounded by genii who presided over the lamps forming his constellation. At his appearing the stars prepared themselves for battle, the heavenly archers rushed forward, the bones of the gods upon the horizon trembled at the sight of him, for it was no common game that he hunted, but the very gods themselves. One attendant secured the prey with a lasso, as bulls are caught in the pastures, while another examined each capture to decide if it were pure and good for food. This being determined, others bound the divine victim, cut its throat, disemboweled it, cut up its carcass, cast the joints into a pot, and superintended their cooking. Sahu did not devour indifferently all that the fortune of the chase might bring him, but classified his game in accordance with his wants. He ate the great gods at his breakfast in the morning, the lesser gods at his dinner towards noon, and the small ones at his supper. The old were rendered more tender by roasting. As each god was assimilated by him, its most precious virtues were transfused into himself. By the wisdom of the old was his wisdom strengthened, the youth of the youth repaired the daily waste of his own youth, and all their fires, as they penetrated his being, served to maintain the perpetual splendor of his light. The Nome gods who presided over the destinies of Egyptian cities, and formed a true feudal system of divinities, belonged to one or the other of these natural categories. In vain do they present themselves under the most shifting aspects and the most deceptive attributes, in vain disguise themselves with the utmost care. A closer examination generally discloses the principal features of their original physiognomies. Osiris of the Delta, Kuumu of the Cataract, Harshafitu of Heracleopolis, were each of them incarnations of the fertilizing and life-sustaining Nile. Wherever there is some important change in the river, there they are more especially installed and worshipped. Knumu at the place of its entering into Egypt, and again at the town of Haurit, near the point where a great arm branches off from the eastern stream to flow towards the Libyan hills, and form the Bar Yusuf. Harshafitu at the gorges of the Fayum, where the Bar Yusuf leaves the valley, and finally Osiris at Mendes and at Busiris, towards the mouth of the middle branch, which was held to be the true Nile by the people of the land. Isis of Buto denoted the black vegetable mold of the valley, the distinctive soil of Egypt annually covered and fertilized by the inundation. But the earth in general, as distinguished from the sky, the earth with its continents, its seas, its alternation of barren deserts and fertile lands, was represented as a man, Phtah at Memphis, Amun at Thebes, Minu at Koptos and at Panopolis. Amun seems rather to have symbolized the productive soil, while Minu reigned over the desert. But these were fine distinctions, not invariably insisted upon, and his worshippers often invested Ammon with the most significant attributes of Minu. The sky gods, like the earth gods, were separated into two groups, the one consisting of women, Hathor of Denderah, or Neat of Saïs, the other composed of men identical with Horus, or derived from him, Anhuri Shu of Sebenitos and Thinis, Hamurati, Horus of the Two Eyes, at Farbethos, Harsapdi, Horus, the source of the zodiacal light, in the Wadi Tumilat, and finally Harhuditi at Edfu. Ra, the solar disk, was enthroned at Heliopolis, and sun gods were numerous among the nome deities, but they were sun gods closely connected with gods representing the sky, and resembled Horus quite as much as Ra. 
Whether under the name of Horus or Anhuri, the sky was early identified with its most brilliant luminary, its solar eye, and its divinity, as it were, fused into that of the sun. Horus the sun, and Ra the sun-god of Heliopolis, had so permeated each other that none could say where the one began and the other ended. One by one all the functions of Ra had been usurped by Horus, and all the designations of Horus had been appropriated by Ra. The sun was styled Harmakuiti, the Horus of the two mountains, that is, the Horus who comes forth from the mountain of the east in the morning, and retires at evening into the mountain of the west, or Hartima, Horus the pikeman, that Horus whose lance spears the hippopotamus or the serpent of the celestial river, or Hanubi, the golden Horus, the great golden sparrow-hawk with mottled plumage, who puts all other birds to flight, and these titles were indifferently applied to each of the feudal gods who represented the sun. The latter were numerous. Sometimes, as in the case of Harkobi, Horus of Kobiu, a geographical qualification was appended to the generic term of Horus, while specific names, almost invariably derived from the parts which they were supposed to play, were borne by others. The sky god worshipped at Thinis in Upper Egypt, at Zarit and Sebenitos in Lower Egypt, was called Anhuri. When he assumed the attributes of Ra, and took upon himself the solar nature, his name was interpreted as denoting the conqueror of the sky. He was essentially combative. Crowned with a group of upright plumes, his spear raised and ever ready to strike his foe, he advanced along the firmament and triumphantly traversed it day by day. The sun-god who at Metamoth, Todd, and Erment had preceded Ammon as ruler of the Theban plain, was also a warrior, and his name of Montu had reference to his method of fighting. He was depicted as brandishing a curved sword and cutting off the heads of his adversaries. Each of the feudal gods naturally cherished pretensions to universal dominion, and proclaimed himself the suzerain, the father of all the gods, as the local prince was the suzerain, the father of all men. But the effective suzerainty of god or prince really ended where that of his peers ruling over the adjacent nomes began. The goddesses shared in the exercise of supreme power, and had the same right of inheritance and possession as regards sovereignty that women had in human law. Isis was entitled Lady and Mistress at Buto, as Hathor was at Denderah, and as Neat at Saïs, the first-born, when as yet there had been no birth. They enjoyed in their cities the same honors as the male gods in theirs. The latter were kings, so were they queens, and all bowed down before them. The animal gods, whether entirely in the form of beasts, or having human bodies attached to animal heads, shared omnipotence with those in human form. Horus of Hibonu swooped down upon the back of a gazelle like a hunting hawk. Hathor of Dendera was a cow. Bastet of Bubastis was a cat or a tigress, while Nekhabit of El Cobb was a great bald-headed vulture. Hermopolis worshipped the ibis and Cenocephalus of thought. Oxyrhynchus, the Mormiris fish, and Ambos and the Fayum a crocodile, under the name of Sobku, sometimes with the epithet of Azei, the brigand. We cannot always understand what led the inhabitants of each nome to affect one animal rather than another. Why, towards Greco-Roman times, should they have worshipped the jackal, or even the dog, at Siut? How came Siut to be incarnate in a fennec, or in an imaginary quadruped? Occasionally, however, we can follow the train of thought that determined their choice. The habit of certain monkeys in assembling, as it were, in full court, and chattering noisily a little before sunrise and sunset, would almost justify the as yet uncivilized Egyptians in entrusting Cenocephaly with the charge of hailing the god morning and evening, as he appeared in the east or passed away in the west. End of section 10 Chapter 2 The Gods of Egypt, Part 3 if Ra was held to be a grasshopper under the old empire, it was because he flew far up in the sky like the clouds of locusts driven from Central Africa, which suddenly fall upon the fields and ravage them. Most of the Nile gods, Kanumu, Osiris, Harshafiti, were incarnate in the form of a ram or of a buck. Does not the masculine vigor and procreative rage of these animals naturally point them out as fitting images of the life-giving Nile and the overflowing of its waters? It is easy to understand how the neighborhood of a marsh or of a rock-encumbered rapid 
should have suggested the crocodile as supreme deity to the inhabitants of the Fayum or of the Ambos. The crocodiles there multiplied so rapidly as to constitute a serious danger. There they had the mastery, and could be appeased only by means of prayers and sacrifices. When instinctive terror had been superseded by reflection, and some explanation was offered of the origin of the various cults, the very nature of the animal seemed to justify the veneration with which it was regarded. The crocodile is amphibious, and Subku was supposed to be a crocodile, because before the creation the sovereign god plunged recklessly into the dark waters and came forth to form the world, as the crocodile emerges from the river to lay its eggs upon the bank. Most of the feudal divinities began their lives in solitary grandeur, apart from, and often hostile to their neighbors. Families were assigned to them later. Each appropriated two companions and formed a trinity, or, as it is generally called, a triad. But there were several kinds of triads. In nomes subject to a god, the local deity was frequently content with one wife and one son, but often he was united to two goddesses, who were at once his sisters and his wives, according to the national custom. Thus thought of Hermopolis possessed himself of a harem consisting of Seshet Seik Habitui and Hamuit. Tumu derived the homage of the inhabitants of Heliopolis with Nebthopit and with Eosuit. Knumu seduced and married the two fairies of the neighboring cataract, Anukit the Constrainer, who compresses the Nile between its rocks at Philae and at Syene, and Satit the Archeress, who shoots forth the current straight and swift as an arrow. Where a goddess reigned over a nome, the triad was completed by two male deities, a divine consort and a divine son. Neat of Sais had taken for her husband Osiris of Mendes, and born for him a lion's whelp, Ari Hosnofor. Hathor of Dendera had completed her household with Haroris and a younger Horus, with the epithet of Ahi, he who strikes the sistrum. A triad containing two goddesses produced no legitimate offspring, and was unsatisfactory to a people who regarded the lack of progeny as a curse from heaven. One in which the presence of a son promised to ensure the perpetuity of the race was more in keeping with the idea of a blessed and prosperous family, as that of God should be. Triads of the former kind were therefore almost everywhere broken up into two new triads, each containing a divine father, a divine mother, and a divine son. Two fruitful households arose from the barren union of thought with Safketabui and Namahuit, one composed of thought, Safketabui and Harnabi, the golden sparrowhawk, into the other, Namahuit and her nursling Norfirhiru entered. The persons united with the old feudal divinities in order to form triads were not all of the same class. Goddesses especially were made to order, and might often be described as grammatical, so obvious is the linguistic device to which they owe their being. From Ra, Ammon, Horus, Sobku, female Ras, Anians, Horuses, and Sobkus were derived. By the addition of the regular feminine affects to the primitive masculine names, Rait, Ammonit, Horit, Sobkit. In the same way, detached cognomens of divine fathers were embodied in divine sons. Imhatpu, he who comes in peace, was merely one of the epithets of Ptah before he became incarnate as the third member of the Memphite triad. In other cases, alliances were contracted between divinities of ancient stock, but natives of different nomes, as in the case of Isis of Buto and the Mendesian Osiris, of Herorus of Edfu and Hathor of Dendera. In the same manner, Sokit of Latopolis and Bastit of Bubastis were appropriated as wives to Ptah of Memphis, Nofirtimu being represented as his son by both unions. These improvised connections were generally determined by considerations of vicinity. The gods of coterminous principalities were married as the children of kings of two adjoining kingdoms are married, to form or consolidate relations, and to establish bonds of kinship between rival powers, whose unremitting hostility would mean the swift ruin of entire people. The system of triads, begun in primitive times and continued unbrokenly up to the last days of Egyptian polytheism, far from any way lowering the prestige of the feudal gods, was rather the means of enhancing it in the eyes of the multitude. Powerful lords as the newcomers might be at home, it was only in the strength of an auxiliary title that they could enter a strange city, 
and then only on condition of submitting to its religious law. Hathor, supreme at Denderah, shrank into insignificance before Heroris at Edfu, and there retained only the somewhat subordinate part of a wife in the house of her husband. On the other hand, Haroris, when at Denderah, descended from the supreme rank, and was nothing more than the almost useless consort of the Lady Hathor. His name came first in invocations of the triad because of his position therein as husband and father, but this was simply a concession to the propriety of etiquette, and even though named in second place, Hathor was none the less the real chief of Denderah and of its divine family. Thus the principal personage in any triad was always the one who had been patron of the nome previous to the introduction of the triad, in some places the father god, and in others the mother goddess. The son in a divine triad had of himself but limited authority. When Isis and Osiris were his parents, he was generally an infant Horus, naked or simply adorned with necklaces and bracelets, a thick lock of hair depending from his temple, and his mother squatting on her heels, or as sitting, nursed him upon her knees, offering him her breast. Even in triads where the son was supposed to have attained to man's estate, he held the lowest place, and there was enjoined upon him the same respectful attitude towards his parents, as is observed by children of human race in the presence of theirs. He took the lowest place at all solemn receptions, spoke only with his parents' permission, acted only by their command and as the agent of their will. Occasionally he was vouchsafed a character of his own, and filled a definite position, as at Memphis, where Imhotpu was the patron of science. But generally he was not considered as having either office or marked individuality. His being was but a feeble reflection of his father's, and possessed neither life nor power except as derived from him. Two such contiguous personalities must needs have been confused, and as a matter of fact, were so confused as to become at length nothing more than two aspects of the same god, who united in his own person degrees of relationship mutually exclusive of each other in a human family. Father, inasmuch as he was the first member of the triad, son, by virtue of being its third member, identical with himself in both capacities, he was at once his own father, his own son, and the husband of his mother. Gods like men might be resolved into at least two elements, soul and body, but in Egypt the conception of the soul varied in different times and in different schools. It might be an insect, butterfly, bee, or praying mantis, or a bird, the ordinary sparrowhawk, the human-headed sparrowhawk, a heron, or a crane, by, high, whose wings enabled it to pass rapidly through space, or the black shadow, kaibit, that is attached to everybody, but which death sets free, and which thenceforward leads an independent existence, so that it can move about at will, and go out into the open sunlight. Finally, it might be a kind of light shadow, like a reflection from the surface of calm water, or from a polished mirror, the living and colored projection of the human figure, a double ka, reproducing in minutest detail the complete image of the object or the person to whom it belonged. The soul, the shadow, the double of a god, was in no way essentially different from the soul, shadow, or double of a man. His body, indeed, was molded out of a more rarefied substance, and generally invisible, but endowed with the same qualities, and subject to the same imperfections as ours. The gods, therefore, on the whole, were more ethereal, stronger, more powerful, better fitted to command, to enjoy, and to suffer than ordinary men, but they were still men. They had bones, muscles, flesh, blood. They were hungry and ate, they were thirsty and drank. Our passions, griefs, joys, infirmities were also theirs. The Sa, a mysterious fluid, circulated throughout their members, and carried with it health, vigor, and life. They were not all equally charged with it. Some had more, others less, their energy being in proportion to the amount which they contained. The better supplied willingly gave of their superfluity to those who lacked it, and all who could readily transmit it to mankind, this transfusion being easily accomplished in the temples. The king, or any ordinary man who wished to be thus impregnated, presented himself before the statue of the god, and squatted at its feet with his back towards it. The statue then placed its right hand upon the nape of his neck, and by making passes, caused the fluid to flow from it, and to accumulate in him as a receiver. This rite was of temporary efficacy only, and required frequent renewal in order that its benefit might be maintained. 
By using or transmitting it, the gods themselves exhausted their saw of life, and the less vigorous replenished themselves from the stronger, while the latter went to draw fresh fullness from a mysterious pond in the northern sky, called the Pond of the Saw. Divine bodies, continually recruited by the influx of this magic fluid, preserved their vigor far beyond the term allotted to the bodies of men and beasts. Age, instead of quickly destroying them, hardened and transformed them into precious metals. Their bones were changed to silver, their flesh to gold. Their hair, piled up and painted blue after the manner of great chiefs, was turned into lapis lazuli. This transformation of each into an animated statue did not altogether do away with the ravages of time. Decrepitude was no less irremediable with them as with men, although it came to them more slowly. When the sun had grown old, his mouth trembled, his driveling ran down to the earth, his spittle dropped upon the ground. None of the feudal gods had escaped this destiny. For them, as for mankind, the day came when they must leave the city and go forth to the tomb. The ancients long refused to believe that death was natural and inevitable. They thought that life, once began, might go on indefinitely. If no accident stopped it short, why should it cease of itself? And so men did not die in Egypt, they were assassinated. The murderer often belonged to this world, and was easily recognized as another man, an animal, some inanimate object such as a stone loosened from a hillside, a tree which fell upon the passerby and crushed him. But too often the murderer was of the unseen world, and so was hidden, his presence being betrayed in his malignant attacks only. He was a god, an evil spirit, a disembodied soul who slyly insinuated itself into the living man, or fell upon him with irresistible violence, illness being a struggle between the one possessed and the power which possessed him. As soon as the former succumbed he was carried away from his own people, and his place knew him no more. But had all ended for him with the moment which he had ceased to breathe? As to the body, no one was ignorant of its natural fate. It quickly fell into decay, and a few years sufficed to reduce it to a skeleton. And as for the skeleton, in the lapse of centuries that too was disintegrated, and became a mere train of dust, to be blown away by the first breath of wind. The soul might have a longer career and fuller fortunes, but these were believed to be dependent upon those of the body, and commensurate with them. Every advance made in the process of decomposition robbed the soul of some part of itself. Its consciousness gradually faded until nothing was left, but a vague and hollow form that vanished altogether when the corpse had entirely disappeared. From an early date the Egyptians endeavored to arrest this gradual destruction of the human organism, and their first effort to this end naturally was directed towards the preservation of the body, since without it the existence of the soul could not be ensured. It was imperative that during that last sleep, which for them was fraught with such terrors, the flesh should neither become decomposed nor turn to dust, that it should be free from offensive odor and secure from predatory worms. They set to work, therefore, to discover how to preserve it. The oldest burials which have as yet been found prove that these early inhabitants were successful in securing the permanence of the body for a few decades only. When one of them died, his son or his nearest relative carefully washed the corpse in water impregnated with an astringent or aromatic substance, such as natron or some solution of fragrant gums, and then fumigated it with burning herbs and perfumes, which were destined to overpower, at least temporarily, the odor of death. Having taken these precautions, they placed the body in the grave, sometimes entirely naked, sometimes partially covered with its ordinary garments, or sewn up in a closely fitting gazelle skin. The dead man was placed on his left side, lying north and south with his face to the east, in some cases on the bare ground, in others on a mat, a strip of leather or a fleece, in the position of a child in the fetal state. The knees were sharply bent at an angle of forty-five degrees, with the thighs, while the latter were either at right angles with the body, or drawn up so as almost to touch the elbows. The hands are sometimes extended in front of the face, sometimes the arms are folded and the hands are joined on the breast or neck. In some instances the legs are bent upward in such a fashion that they almost lie parallel with the trunk. The deceased could only be made to assume this position by a violent effort, and in many cases the tendons and the flesh had to be cut to facilitate the operation. The dryness of the ground selected for these burial places retarded the corruption of the flesh for a long time, it is true, but only retarded it, and so did not prevent the soul from being finally destroyed. End of section 11
Chapter Two, The Gods of Egypt, Part Four. Seeing decay could not be prevented, it was determined to accelerate the process by taking the flesh from the bones before interment. The bodies thus treated are often incomplete. The head is missing, or is detached from the neck and laid in another part of the pit. Or, on the other hand, the body is not there, and the head only is found in the grave, generally placed apart on a brick, a heap of stones, or a layer of cut flints. The forearms and the hands were subjected to the same treatment as the head. In many cases, no trace of them appears. In others, they are deposited by the side of the skull or scattered about haphazard. Other mutilations are frequently met with. The ribs are divided and piled up behind the body. The limbs are disjointed or the body is entirely dismembered, and the fragments arranged upon the ground or enclosed together in an earthenware chest. These precautions were satisfactory in so far as they ensured the better preservation of the more solid parts of the human frame, but the Egyptians felt this result was obtained at too great a sacrifice. The human organism, thus deprived of all flesh, was not only reduced to half its bulk, but what remained had neither unity, consistency, nor continuity. It was not even a perfect skeleton, with its constituent parts in their relative places, but a mere mass of bones with no connecting links. This drawback, it is true, was remedied by the artificial reconstruction in the tomb of the individual thus completely dismembered in the course of the funeral ceremonies. The bones were laid in their natural order, those of the feet at the bottom, then those of the leg, trunk, and arms, and finally the skull itself. But the superstitious fear inspired by the dead man, particularly of one thus harshly handled, and particularly the apprehension that he might revenge himself on his relatives for the treatment to which they had subjected him, often induced them to make this restoration intentionally incomplete. When they had reconstructed the entire skeleton, they refrained from placing the head in position, or else they suppressed one or all of the vertebras of the spine, so that the deceased should be unable to rise and go forth to bite and harass the living. Having taken this precaution, they nevertheless felt a doubt whether the soul could really enjoy life, so long as one half only of the body remained, and the other was lost forever. They therefore sought to discover the means of preserving the fleshy parts in addition to the bony framework of the body. It had been observed that when a corpse had been buried in the desert, its skin, speedily desiccated and hardened, changed into a case of blackish parchment beneath which the flesh slowly wasted away and the whole frame thus remained intact, at least in appearance, while its integrity ensured that of the soul. An attempt was made by artificial means to reproduce the conservative action of the sand, and without mutilating the body, to secure at will that incorruptibility, without which the persistence of the soul was but a useless prolongation of the death agony. It was the god Anubis, the jackal lord of sepulture, who was supposed to have made this discovery. He cleansed the body of the viscera, those parts which most rapidly decay, saturated it with salts and aromatic substances, protected it first of all with the hide of a beast, and over this laid thick layers of linen. The victory the god had thus gained over corruption was, however, far from being a complete one. The bath in which the dead man was immersed could not entirely preserve the softer parts of the body. The chief portion of them was dissolved, and what remained after the period of saturation was so desiccated that its bulk was seriously diminished. When any human being had been submitted to this process, he emerged from it a mere skeleton, over which the skin remained tightly drawn. These shriveled limbs, sunken chest, grinning features, yellow and blackened skin, spotted by the efflorescence of the embalmer's salts, were not the man himself, but rather a caricature of what he had been. As nevertheless he was secure against immediate destruction, the Egyptians described him as furnished with his shape. Henceforth he had been purged of all that was evil in him, and he could face with tolerable security whatever awaited him in the future. The art of Anubis, transmitted to the embalmers and employed by them from generation to generation, had, by almost eliminating the corruptible part of the body without destroying its outward appearance, arrested decay, if not forever, at least for an unlimited period of time. If there were hills at hand, thither the mummied dead were still born, partly from custom, partly because the dryness of the air and of the soil offered them a further chance of preservation. In districts of the delta, where the hills were so distant as to make it very costly to reach them, advantage was taken of the smallest sandy islet rising above the marches, and there a cemetery was founded. 
Where this resource failed, the mummy was fearlessly entrusted to the soil itself, but only after being placed within a sarcophagus of hard stone, whose lid and trough, hermetically fastened together with cement, prevented the penetration of any moisture. Reassured on this point, the soul followed the body to the tomb, and there dwelt with it as in its eternal house, upon the confines of the visible and invisible world. Here the soul kept the distinctive character and appearance which pertained to it upon the earth. As it had been a double before death, so it remained a double after it, able to perform all functions of animal life after its own fashion. It moved, went, came, spoke, breathed, accepted pious homage, but without pleasure, and as it were mechanically, rather from an instinctive horror of annihilation than from any rational desire for immortality. Unceasing regret for the bright world which it had left disturbed its mournful and inert existence. O oh, my brother, withhold not thyself from drinking and from eating, from drunkenness, from love, from all enjoyment, from following thy desire by night and by day. Put not sorrow within thy heart, for what are the years of a man upon earth? The West is a land of sleep and of heavy shadows, a place wherein its inhabitants, when once installed, slumber on in their mummy forms, never more waking to see their brethren, never more to recognize their fathers or their mothers, with hearts forgetful of their wives and children. The living water, which earth giveth to all who dwell upon it, is for me but stagnant and dead. That water floweth to all who are on earth, while for me it is but liquid putrefaction, this water that is mine. Since I came into this funereal valley, I know not where, nor what, I am. Give me to drink of running water. Let me be placed by the edge of the water with my face to the north, that the breeze may caress me, and my heart be refreshed from its sorrow. By day the double remained concealed within the tomb. If it went forth by night, it was from no capricious or sentimental desire to revisit the spots where it had led a happier life. Its organs needed nourishment, as formerly did those of its body, and of itself it possessed nothing but hunger for food, thirst for drink. Want and misery drove it from its retreat, and flung it back among the living. It prowled like a marauder about fields and villages, picking up and greedily devouring whatever it might find on the ground, broken meats which had been left or forgotten, house and stable refuse, and, should these meagre resources fail, even the most revolting dung and excrement. This ravenous scepter had not the dim and misty form, the long shroud of floating draperies of our modern phantoms, but a precise and definite shape, naked or clothed in the garments which it had worn while yet upon earth, and emitting a pale light to which it owed the name of luminous. Ku, Ku. The double did not allow its family to forget it, but used all the means at its disposal to remind them of its existence. It entered their houses and their bodies, terrified them waking and sleeping by its sudden apparitions, struck them down with disease or madness, and would even suck their blood like the modern vampire. One effectual means there was, and one only, of escaping or preventing these visitations, and this lay in taking to the tomb all the various provisions of which the double stood in need, and for which it visited their dwellings. Funerary sacrifices and the regular cults of the dead originated in the need experienced for making provision for the sustenance of the menes, after having secured their lasting existence by the mummification of their bodies. Gazelles and oxen were brought and sacrificed at the door of the tomb chapel, the haunches, heart, and breast of each victim being presented and heaped together upon the ground, that there the dead might find them when they began to be hungry. Vessels of beer or wine, great jars of fresh water, purified with natron, or perfumed, were brought to them that they might drink their fill at pleasure, and by such voluntary tribute men bought their good will, as in daily life they bought that of some neighbor too powerful to be opposed. The gods were spared none of the anguish and none of the perils which death so plentifully bestows upon men. Their bodies suffered change and gradually perished until nothing was left of them. Their souls, like human souls, were only the representatives of their bodies, and gradually became extinct if means of arresting the natural tendency to decay were not found in time. Thus the same necessity that forced men to seek the kind of sepulture which gave the longest term of existence to their souls, compelled the gods to the same course. At first they were buried in the hills, and one of their oldest titles describes them as those who are upon the sand, safe from putrefaction, 
Afterwards, when the art of embalming had been discovered, the gods received the benefit of the new invention and were mummified. Each nome possessed the mummy and the tomb of its dead god. At Thinis there was the mummy and tomb of Enhuri, the mummy of Osiris at Mendes, the mummy of Tumu at Heliopolis. In some of the gnomes the gods did not change their names in altering the mode of their existence. The deceased Osiris remained Osiris. Nit and Hathor, when dead, were still Nit and Hathor, at Sais and at Dendera. But Ptah of Memphis became Socaris by dying. Uaputu, the jackal of Siut, was changed into Anubis. And when his disc had disappeared at evening, Anhuri, the sunlit sky of Thinis, was Contamentit, lord of the west, until the following day. That bliss which we dream of enjoying in the world to come was not granted to the gods any more than to men. Their bodies were nothing but inert larvae, with unmoving heart, weak and shriveled limbs, unable to stand upright, were it not that the bandages in which they were swathed stiffened them into one rigid block. Their hands and heads alone were free, and were of the green or black shades of putrid flesh. Their doubles, like those of men, both dreaded and regretted the light. A sentiment was extinguished by the hunger from which they suffered, and gods who were noted for their compassionate kindness when alive, became pitiless and ferocious tyrants in the tomb. When once men were bidden to the presence of Socaris, Contamentific, or even of Osiris, mortals came terrifying their hearts with fear of the god, and none dareth to look him in the face, either among gods or men. For him the great are as the small. He spareth not those who love him, he beareth away the child from its mother, and the old man who walketh on his way, full of fear, all creatures make supplication before him, but he turneth not his face towards them. Only by the unfailing payment of tribute, and by feeding him as though he were a simple human double, could living or dead escape the consequences of his furious temper. The living paid him his dues in pomps and solemn sacrifices, repeated from year to year at regular intervals, but the dead bought more dearly the protection which he deigned to extend to them. He did not allow them to receive directly the prayers, sepulchre meals, or offerings of kindred on feast days. All that was addressed to them must first pass through his hands. When their friends wished to send them wine, water, bread, meat, vegetables, and fruits, he insisted that these should first be offered and formally presented to himself. Then he was humbly prayed to transmit them to such or such a double, whose name and parentage were pointed out to him. He took possession of them, kept part for his own use, and of his bounty gave the remainder to its destined recipient. Thus death made no change in the relative positions of the feudal god and his worshippers. The worshipper who called himself the Amuku of the god during life was the subject and vassal of his mummied god even in the tomb, and the god who, while living, reigned over the living, after his death continued to reign over the dead. He dwelt in the city near the prince and in the midst of his subjects, Ra living in Heliopolis along with the prince of Heliopolis, Heroras in Edfu together with the prince of Edfu, Nit in Sais with the prince of Sais. End of section 12. Chapter 2. The Gods of Egypt. Part 5. Although none of the primitive temples have come down to us, the name given them in the language of the time shows what they originally were. A temple was considered as the feudal mansion, Hait, the house, Piru, P, of the god, better cared for and more respected than the houses of men, but not otherwise differing from them. It was built on a site slightly raised above the level of the plain, so as to be safe from the inundation, and where there was no natural mound, the want was supplied by raising a rectangular platform of earth. A layer of sand spread uniformly on the subsoil provided against settlements or infiltrations, and formed a bed for the foundations of the building. This was first of all a single room, circumscribed, gloomy, covered in by a slightly vaulted roof, and having no opening but the doorway, which was framed by two tall masts, whence floated streamers to attract from afar the notice of worshippers. In front of its façade was a court, fenced in with palisading. Within the temple were pieces of matting, low tables of stone, wood, or metal, a few utensils for cooking the offerings, a few vessels for containing the blood, oil, wine, and water with which the god was every day regaled. As provisions for sacrifice increased, the number of chambers increased with them, 
and rooms for flowers, perfumes, stuffs, precious vessels, and food were grouped around the primitive abode, until that which had once constituted the whole temple became no more than its sanctuary. There the god dwelt, not only in spirit but in body, and the fact that it was incumbent upon him to live in several cities did not prevent his being present in all of them at once. He could divide his double, imparting it to as many separate bodies as he pleased, and these bodies might be human or animal, natural objects or things manufactured, such as statues of stone, metal, or wood. Several of the gods were incarnate in rams, Osiris at Mendes, Harshafitu at Heracleopolis, Kanumu at Elephantine. Living rams were kept in their temples, and allowed to gratify any fancy that came into their animal brains. Other gods entered into bulls, Ra at Heliopolis, and subsequently Ptah at Memphis, Minu at Thebes, and Montu at Hermonthes. They indicated beforehand by certain marks such beasts as they intended to animate by their doubles, and he who had learnt to recognize these signs was at no loss to find a living god, when the time came for seeking one, and presenting it to the adoration of worshippers in the temple. And if the statues had not the same outward appearance of actual life as the animals, they none the less concealed beneath their rigid exteriors an intense energy of life, which betrayed itself on occasion by gestures or by words. They thus indicated, in language which their servants could understand, the will of the gods, or their opinion on the events of the day. They answered questions put to them in accordance with prescribed forms, and sometimes they even foretold the future. Each temple had a fairly large number of statues representing so many embodiments of the local divinity, and of the members of his triad. These latter shared, albeit in a lesser degree, all the honors and the prerogatives of the master. They accepted sacrifices, answered prayers, and if needful they prophesied. They occupied either the sanctuary itself, or one of the halls built about the principal sanctuary, or one of the isolated chapels which belonged to them, subject to the suzerainty of the feudal god. The god has his divine court to help him in the administration of his dominions, just as a prince is aided by his ministers in the government of his realm. This state religion, so complex both in principle and in its outward manifestations, was nevertheless inadequate to express the exuberant piety of the populace. There were casual divinities in every nome whom the people did not love any the less because of their inofficial character, such as an exceptionally high palm tree in the midst of the desert, a rock of curious outline, a spring trickling drop by drop from the mountain to which hunters came to slake their thirst in the hottest hours of the day, or a great serpent believed to be immortal, which haunted a field, a grove of trees, a grotto, or a mountain ravine. The peasants of the district brought it bread, cakes, fruits, and thought that they could call down the blessings of heaven upon their fields by gorging the snake with offerings. Everywhere on the confines of cultivated ground, and even at some distance from the valley, are fine single sycamores, flourishing as though by miracle amid the sand. Their fresh greenness is in sharp contrast with the surrounding fawn-colored landscape, and their thick foliage defies the midday sun even in summer. But on examining the ground in which they grow, we soon find that they drink from water which is infiltrated from the Nile, and whose existence is in no wise betrayed upon the surface of the soil. They stand, as it were, with their feet in the river, though no one about them suspects it. Egyptians of all ranks counted them divine and habitually worshipped them, making them offerings of figs, grapes, cucumbers, vegetables, and water in porous jars daily replenished by good and charitable people. Passers-by drank of the water, and requited the unexpected benefit with a short prayer. There were several such trees in the Memphite Nome, and in the Leto Paulite Nome from Dashur to Giza, inhabited, as every one knew, by detached doubles of Nuit and Hathor. These combined districts were known as the Land of the Sycamore, a name afterwards extended to the city of Memphis, and their sacred trees are worshipped at the present day, both by Mussulman and Christian Fellahin. The most famous among them all, the Sycamore of the South, Nihit Risit, was regarded as the living body of Hathor on earth. Side by side with its human gods and prophetic statues, each nome proudly advanced one or more sacred animals, one or more magic trees. Each family, and almost every individual, also possessed gods and fetishes, which had been pointed out for their worship by some fortuitous meeting with an animal or object, by a dream, or by sudden intuition. 
They had a place in some corner of the house, or a niche in its walls, lamps were continually kept burning before them, and small daily offerings were made to them, over and above what fell to their share on solemn feast days. In return they became the protectors of the household, its guardians and its counselors. Appeal was made to them in every exigency of daily life, and their decisions were no less scrupulously carried out by their little circle of worshippers than was the will of the feudal god by the inhabitants of his principality. The prince was the great high priest. The whole religion of the nome rested upon him, and originally he himself performed its ceremonies. Of these the chief was sacrifice, that is to say, a banquet which it was his duty to prepare and lay before the god with his own hands. He went out into the fields to lasso a half-wild bull, bound it, cut its throat, skinned it, burnt part of the carcass in front of his idol, and distributed the rest among his assistants, together with plenty of cakes, fruits, vegetables, and wine. On the occasion, the god was present both in body and double, suffering himself to be clothed and perfumed, eating and drinking of the best that was set on the table before him, and putting aside some of the provision for future use. This was the time to prefer requests to him, while he was gladdened and disposed to benevolence by good cheer. He was not without suspicion as to the reason why he was so feasted, but he had laid down his conditions beforehand, and if they were faithfully observed he willingly yielded to the means of seduction brought to bear upon him. Moreover, he himself had arranged the ceremonial in a kind of contract, formerly made with his worshippers and gradually perfected from age to age, by the piety of new generations. Above all things he insisted on physical cleanliness. The officiating priest must carefully wash, uabu, his face, mouth, hands, and body, and so necessary was this preliminary purification considered, that from it the professional priest derived his name of uibu, the washed, the clean. His costume was the archaic dress, modified according to circumstances. During certain services, or at certain points in the sacrifices, it was incumbent upon him to wear sandals, the panther skin over his ear, and the thick lock of hair falling over his right ear. At other times he must gird himself with the loincloth having a jackal's tail, and take the shoes from off his feet before proceeding with his office, or attach a false beard to his chin. The species, hair, and age of the victim, the way in which it was to be brought and bound, the manner and details of its slaughter, the order to be followed in opening its body and cutting it up, were all minutely and unchangeably decreed. And these were but the least of the divine exactions, and those most easily satisfied. The formulas accompanying each act of the sacrificial priests contained a certain number of words, whose due sequence and harmonies might not suffer the slightest modification whatever, even from the god himself, under penalty of losing their efficacy. They were always recited with the same rhythm, according to a system of chanting in which every tone had its virtue, combined with movements which confirmed the sense and worked with irresistible effect. One false note, a single discord between the succession of gestures and the utterance of the sacramental words, any hesitation, any awkwardness in the accomplishment of a rite, and the sacrifice was vain. Worship as thus conceived became a legal transaction in the course of which the god gave up his liberty in exchange for certain compensations, whose kind and value were fixed by law. By a solemn deed of transfer the worshipper handed over to the legal representatives of the contracting divinity such personal or real property as seemed to him fitting payment for the favor which he asked, or suitable atonement for the wrong which he had done. If man scrupulously observed the innumerable conditions with which the transfer was surrounded, the god could not escape the obligation of fulfilling his petition. But should he omit the least of them, the offering remained with the temple and went to increase the endowments in Mortimen, while the god was pledged to nothing in exchange. Hence the officiating priest assumed a formidable responsibility as regarded his fellows. A slip of memory, the slightest accidental impurity, made him a bad priest, injurious to himself and harmful to those worshippers who had entrusted him with their interests before the gods. Since it was vain to expect ritualistic perfections from a prince constantly troubled with affairs of state, the custom was established of associating professional priests with him, personages who devoted all their lives to the study and practice of the thousand formalities whose sum constituted the local religion. Each temple had its service of priests, 
independent of those belonging to neighboring temples, whose members, bound to keep their hands always clean and their voices true, were ranked according to the degrees of a learned hierarchy. At their head was a sovereign pontiff to direct them in the exercise of their functions. In some places he was called the first prophet, or rather the first servant of the god, Han Nutur Tapi. At Thebes he was the first prophet of Ammon, at Tinnis he was the first prophet of Anhuri. But generally he bore a title appropriate to the nature of the god whose servant he was. The chief priest of Ra at Heliopolis, and in all the cities which adopted the Heliopolitan form of worship, was called Oruhu Mal, the master of visions, and he alone, besides the sovereign of the Nome, or of Egypt, enjoyed the privilege of penetrating into the sanctuary, of entering into heaven and there beholding the god face to face. In the same way, the high priest of Anhuri at Sebenitos was entitled the wise and pure warrior, Ahuiti Sau Uibu, because his god went armed with a pike, and a soldier god required for his service a pontiff who should be a soldier like himself. These great personages did not always strictly seclude themselves within the limits of their religious domain. The gods accepted, and even sometimes solicited, from their worshippers, houses, fields, vineyards, orchards, slaves, and fish-ponds, the produce of which assured their livelihood in the support of their temples. There was no Egyptian who did not cherish the ambition of leaving some such legacy to the patron god of his city, for a monument to himself, and as an endowment for the priest to institute prayers and perpetual sacrifices on his behalf. In course of time these accumulated gifts at length formed real sacred fiefs, hapu nutir, analogous to the wax of Mussulman Egypt. They were administered by the high priest, who, if necessary, defended them by force against the greed of princes or kings. Two, three, or even four classes of prophets, or hier oduli, under his orders, assisted him in performing the offices of worship, in giving religious instruction, and in the conduct of affairs. Women did not hold equal rank with men in the temples of male deities. They there formed a kind of harem whence the god took his mystic spouses, his concubines, his maidservants, the female musicians and dancing women, whose duty it was to divert him and to enliven his feasts. But in temples of goddesses they held the chief rank, and were called Herodules, or priestesses, Herodules of Neat, Herodules of Hathor, Herodules of Pakit. End of section 13 Chapter 2 The Gods of Egypt, Part 6 The lower offices in the households of the gods, as in princely households, were held by a troop of servants and artisans, butchers to cut the throats of the victims, cooks and pastry cooks, confectioners, weavers, shoemakers, florists, cellarers, water carriers, and milk carriers. In fact, it was a state within a state, and the prince took care to keep its government in his own hands, either by investing one of his children with the titles and functions of chief pontiff, or by arrogating them to himself. In that case he provided against mistakes which would have annulled the sacrifice by associating with himself several masters of the ceremonies, who directed him in the orthodox evolutions before the god and about the victim, indicated the due order of gestures and the necessary changes of costume, and prompted him with the words of each invocation from a book or tablet which they held in their hands. In addition to its rites and special hierarchy, each of the sacerdotal colleges thus constituted had a theology in accordance with the nature and attributes of its god. Its fundamental dogma affirmed the unity of the nome god, his greatness, his supremacy over all the gods of Egypt and of foreign lands, whose existence was nevertheless admitted, and none dreamed of denying their reality or contesting their power. The latter also boasted of their unity, their greatness, their supremacy, but whatever they were, the god of the Nome was master of them all, their prince, their ruler, their king. It was he alone who governed the world, he alone kept it in good order, he alone had created it. Not that he had evoked it out of nothing, there was as yet no concept of nothingness, and even to the most subtle and refined of primitive theologians creation was only a bringing of pre-existent elements into play. The latent germs of things had always existed, but they had slept for ages and ages in the bosom of Nu, of the dark waters. In the fullness of time the god of each nome drew them forth, classified them, marshalled them according to the bent of his particular nature, and 
and made his universe out of them, by methods peculiarly his own. Nit of Saïs, who was a weaver, had made the world of warp and woof, as the mother of a family weaves her children's linen. Kanumu, the Nile god of the cataracts, had gathered up the mud of his waters, and therewith moulded his creatures upon a potter's table. In the eastern cities of the Delta these procedures were not so simple. There it was admitted that, in the beginning, earth and sky were two lovers lost in the new, fast locked in each other's embrace, the god lying beneath the goddess. On the day of creation a new god, Shu, came forth from the primeval waters, slipped between the two, and seizing Nuit with both hands, lifted her above his head with outstretched arms. Though the starry body of the goddess extended in space, her head being to the west and her loins to the east, her feet and hands hung down to the earth. These were the four pillars of the firmament under another form, and four gods of the four adjacent principalities were in charge of them. Osiris, or Horus the Sparrowhawk, presided over the southern, and Sit over the northern pillar, Thought over that of the west, and Sapti, the author of the zodiacal light, over that of the east. They had divided the world among themselves into four regions, or rather into four houses, bounded by those mountains which surround it, and by the diameters intersecting between the pillars. Each of the houses belonged to one, and to one only, none of the other three, nor even the sun himself, might enter it, dwell there, or even pass through it without having obtained its master's permission. Sibu had not been satisfied to meet the eruption of Shu by a mere passive resistance. He had tried to struggle, and he is drawn in the posture of a man who has just awakened out of sleep, and is half turning on his couch before getting up. One of his legs is stretched out, the other is bent and partly drawn up as in the act of rising. The lower part of the body is still unmoved, but he is raising himself with difficulty on his left elbow, while his head droops and his right arm is lifted towards the sky. His effort was suddenly arrested. Rendered powerless by the stroke of the Creator, Sibu remained as if petrified in this position, the obvious irregularities of the earth's surface being due to the painful attitude in which he was stricken. His sides have since been clothed with verdure, Generations of men and animals have succeeded each other upon his back, but without bringing any relief to his pain, he suffers evermore from the violent separation of which he was the victim when Nuit was torn from him, and his complaint continues to rise to heaven night and day. The aspect of the inundated plains of the delta, of the river by which they are furrowed and fertilized, and of the desert sands by which they are threatened, had suggested to the theologians of Mendes and Buto an explanation of the mystery of creation, in which the feudal divinities of these cities and of several others in their neighborhood, Osiris, Set, and Isis, played the principal parts. Osiris first represented the wild and fickle Nile of primitive times. Afterwards, as those who dwelt upon his banks learned to regulate his course, they emphasized the kindlier side of his character, and soon transformed him into a benefactor of humanity, the supremely good being, Onofrui, on Ophirus. He was the lord of the principality of Didu, which lay along the Sebenitic branch of the river between the coast marshes and the entrance to the Wadi Timilat. But his domain had been divided, and the two nomes thus formed, namely the ninth and sixteenth nomes of the delta in the Pharaonic lists, remained faithful to him, and here he reigned without a rival, at Busiris as at Mendes. His most famous idol form was the Didu, whether naked or clothed, the fetish, formed of four superimposed columns, which had given its name to the principality. They ascribed life to this didu, and represented it with a somewhat grotesque face, big cheeks, thick lips, a necklace round its throat, a long flowing dress which hid the base of the columns beneath its folds, and two arms bent across the breast, the hands grasping a whip and the other a crook, symbols of sovereign authority. This perhaps was the most ancient form of Osiris, but they also represented him as a man, and supposed him to assume the shape of rams and bulls, or even those of water-birds, such as lapwings, herons, and cranes, which disported themselves about the lakes of that district. The goddess whom we are accustomed to regard as inseparable from him, Isis the cow, or woman with cow's horns, had not always belonged to him. Originally she was an independent deity, dwelling at Buto in the midst of the ponds of Adhu.
she had neither husband nor lover, but had spontaneously conceived and given birth to a son, whom she suckled among the reeds, a lesser Horus, who was called Harsiasit, Horus the son of Isis, to distinguish him from Herorhus. At an early period she was married to her neighbor Osiris, and no marriage could have been better suited to her nature. For she personified the earth, not the earth in general, like Sibu, with its unequal distribution of seas and mountains, deserts and cultivated land, but the black and luxuriant plain of the delta, where races of men, plants, and animals increase and multiply in ever-succeeding generations. To whom did she owe this inexhaustible productive energy, if not to her neighbor Osiris, to the Nile? The Nile rises, overflows, lingers upon the soil. Every year it is wedded to the earth, and the earth comes forth green and fruitful from its embraces. The marriage of the two elements suggested that of the two divinities. Osiris wedded Isis and adopted the young Horus. But this prolific and gentle pair were not representative of all the phenomena of nature. The eastern part of the delta borders upon the solitudes of Arabia, and although it contains several rich and fertile provinces, yet most of these owe their existence to the arduous labor of the inhabitants, their fertility being dependent on the daily care of man, and on his regular distribution of the water. The moment he suspends the struggle or relaxes his watchfulness, the desert reclaims them and overwhelms them with sterility. Sit was the spirit of the mountain, stone and sand, the red and arid ground as distinguished from the moist black soil of the valley. On the body of a lion or of a dog he bore a fantastic head with a slender curved snout, upright and square-cut ears, his cloven tail rose stiffly behind him, springing from his loins like a fork. He also assumed a human form, or retained the animal head only upon a man's shoulders. He was felt to be cruel and treacherous, always ready to shrivel up the harvest with his burning breath, and to smother Egypt beneath a shroud of sifting sand. The contrast between this evil being and the beneficent couple, Osiris and Isis, was striking. Nevertheless, the theologians of the Delta soon assigned a common origin to these rival divinities of Nile and Desert, Red Land and Black. Sibu had begotten them. Nuit had given birth to them one after another, when the demiurge had separated her from her husband, and the days of their birth were the days of creation. As a matter of fact, his companion, Nephthys, did not manifest any great activity, and was scarcely more than an artificial counterpart of the wife of Osiris, a second Isis who bore no children to her husband, for the sterile desert brought barrenness to her as to all that it touched. Yet she had lost neither the wish nor the power to bring forth, and sought fertilization from another source. Tradition had it that she made Osiris drunken, drawn him to her arms without his knowledge, and borne him a son. The child of this furtive union was the jackal Anubis. Thus when a higher Nile overflows lands not usually covered by the inundation, and lying unproductive for lack of moisture, the soil eagerly absorbs the water, and the germs which lay concealed in the ground burst forth into life. The gradual invasion of the domain of Sit by Osiris marks the beginning of the strife. Sit rebels against the wrong of which he is the victim, involuntary though it was. He surprises and treacherously slays his brother, drives Isis into temporary banishment among her marshes, and reigns over the kingdom of Osiris as well as over his own but his triumph is short-lived. Horus, having grown up, takes arms against him, defeats him in many encounters, and banishes him in his turn. The creation of the world had brought the destroying and the life-sustaining gods face to face. The history of the world is but the story of their rivalries and warfare. None of these conceptions alone suffice to explain the whole mechanism of creation, nor the part which the various gods took in it. The priests of Heliopolis appropriated them all, modified some of their details and eliminated others, added several new personages, and thus finally constructed a complete cosmogony, the elements of which were learnedly combined, so as to correspond severally with the different operations by which the world had been evoked out of chaos, and gradually brought to its present state. Heliopolis was never directly involved in the great revolutions of political history, but no city ever originated so many mystic ideas, and consequently exercised so great an influence upon the development of civilization. It was a small town built on the plain not far from the Nile at the apex of the delta, 
and surrounded by a high wall of mud bricks, whose remains could still be seen at the beginning of the century, but which have now almost completely disappeared. One obelisk standing in the midst of the open plain, a few waste mounds of debris, scattered blocks, and two or three lengths of crumbling wall, alone mark the place where once the city stood. Ka was worshipped there, and the Greek name of Heliopolis is but the translation of that which was given to it by the priests, Pi-Ra, City of the Sun. Its principal temple, the mansion of the prince, rose from about the middle of the enclosure, and sheltered, together with the god himself, those animals in which he became incarnate, the bull, Menevis, and sometimes the phoenix. According to an old legend, this wondrous bird appeared in Egypt only once in five hundred years. It is born and lives in the depths of Arabia, but when its father dies it covers the body with a layer of myrrh, and flies at utmost speed to the temple of Heliopolis, there to bury it. In the beginning Ra was the sun itself, whose fires appear to be lightest every morning in the east, and to be extinguished at evening in the west, and to the people such he always remained. Among the theologians there was considerable difference of opinion on the point. Some held the disk of the sun to be the body which the god assumes when presenting himself for the adoration of his worshippers. Others affirmed that it rather represented his active and radiant soul. Finally, there were many who defined it as one of his forms of being, Kopriu, one of his self-manifestations, without presuming to decide whether it was his body or his soul which he deigned to reveal to human eyes. But whether soul or body, all agreed that the sun's disk had existed in the new before creation. But how could it have lain beneath the primordial ocean without either drying up the waters or being extinguished by them? At this stage the identification of Ra with Horus and his right eye served the purpose of the theologians admirably. The god needed only to have closed his eyelid in order to prevent his fires from coming in contact with the water. He was also said to have shut up his disk within a lotus bud, whose folded petals had safely protected it. The flower had opened on the morning of the first day, and from it the god had sprung suddenly as a child wearing the solar disk upon his head. But all theories led the theologians to distinguish two periods, and, as it were, two beings in the existence of supreme deity, a pre-mundane sun lying inert within the bosom of the dark waters, and our living and life-giving sun. End of section 14 Chapter 2 the Gods of Egypt, Part 7. One division of the Heliopolitan school retained the use of traditional terms and images in reference to these sun gods. To the first it left the human form and the title of Ra, with the abstract sense of creator, deriving the name from the verb Ra, which means to give. For the second it kept the form of the sparrowhawk and the name of Harma Kuiti, Horus in the two horizons, which clearly denoted his function and it summed up the idea of the sun as a whole in the single name of Ra Harmakuiti, and in a single image in which the hawk head of Horus was grafted upon the human body of Ra. The other divisions of the school invented new names for new conceptions. The sun existing before the world they called Creator, Tumu, Atumu, and our earthly sun they called Kopri, He Who Is. Tumu was a man crowned and clothed with the insignia of supreme power, a true king of gods, majestic and impressive as the pharaohs who succeeded each other upon the throne of Egypt. The conception of Kopri as a disc enclosing a scarabaeus, or a man with a scarabus upon his head, or a scarabus-headed mummy, was suggested by the accidental alliteration of his name and that of Kopiru, the scarabus. The difference between the possible forms of the god was so slight as to be eventually lost altogether. His names were grouped by twos and threes in every conceivable way, and the scarabus of Kopri took its place upon the head of Ra, while the hawk headpiece was transferred from the shoulders of Harmakuiti to those of Tumu. The complex beings resulting from these combinations, Ra Tumu, Atumu Ra, Ra Tumu Kopri, Ra Harmakuit Tumu, Tumu Harmakuit Kopri, never attained to any pronounced individuality. They were, as a rule, simple duplicates of the feudal god, names rather than persons, and though hardly taken for one another indiscriminately, the distinctions between them had reference to mere details of their functions and attributes. Hence arose the idea of making these gods into embodiments of the main phases in the life of the sun during the day, 
and throughout the year. Ra symbolized the sun of springtime and before sunrise, Harmakuiti the summer and the morning sun, Atumu the sun of autumn and of afternoon, Kopri that of winter and of night. The people of Heliopolis accepted the new names and the new forms presented for their worship, but always subordinated them to their beloved Ra. For them, Ra never ceased to be the god of the Nome, while Atumu retained the god of the theologians, and was invoked by them, the people preferred Ra. At Thinis and at, Semit, at, Thinis and at Sebenitos, Anhuri incurred the same fate as befell Ra at Heliopolis. After he had been identified with the sun, the similar identification of Shu inevitably followed. Of old, Anhuri and Shu were twin gods, incarnations of sky and earth. They were soon but one god in two persons, the god Anhuri Shu, of which the one half under the title of Anhuri represented, like Atumu, the primordial being, and Shu, the other half, became, as his name indicates, the creative sun god who upholds Shu, the sky. Ternu, then, rather than Ra, was placed by the Heliopolitan priests at the head of their cosmogony as supreme creator and governor. Several versions were current as to how he had passed from inertia into action, from the personage of Tumu into that of Ra. According to the version, most widely received, he had suddenly cried across the waters, Come unto me! And immediately the mysterious lotus had unfolded its petals, and Ra had appeared at the edge of its open cup as a disc, a newborn child, or a disc-crowned sparrowhawk. This was probably a refined form of a ruder and earlier tradition, according to which it was upon Ra himself that the office had devolved, of separating Sibu from Nuit, for the purpose of constructing the heavens and the earth. But it was doubtless felt that so unseemly an act of intervention was beneath the dignity even of an inferior form of the suzerain god. Shu was therefore borrowed for the purpose from the kindred cult of Anhuri, and at Heliopolis, as at Sebenitos, the office was entrusted to him of seizing the sky goddess and raising her with outstretched arms. The violence suffered by Nuit at the hands of Shu led to a connection of the Osirian dogma of Mendes with the solar dogma of Sebenitos, and thus the tradition describing the creation of the world was completed by another, explaining its division into deserts and fertile lands. Sibu, hitherto concealed beneath the body of his wife, was now exposed to the sun. Osiris and Sit, Isis and Nephthys, were born, and falling from the sky, their mother, on to earth, their father. They shared the surface of the latter among themselves. Thus the Heliopolitan doctrine recognized three principal events in the creation of the universe. The dualization of the supreme god and the breaking forth of light, the raising of the sky and the laying bare of the earth, the birth of the Nile and the allotment of the soil of Egypt, all expressed as the manifestations of successive deities. Of these deities, the latter ones already constituted a family of father, mother, and children, like human families. Learned theologians availed themselves of this example to effect analogous relationships between the rest of the gods, combining them all into one line of descent. As Atumu Ra could have no fellow, he stood apart in the first rank, and it was decided that Shu should be his son, whom he had formed out of himself alone, on the first day of creation, by the simple intensity of his own virile energy. Shu, reduced to the position of divine son, had in his turn begotten Sibu and Nuit, the two deities which he separated. Until then he had not been supposed to have any wife, and he, also, might have brought his own progeny into being, but lest a power of spontaneous generation equal to that of the Demiurge should be ascribed to him, he was married, and the wife found for him was Tafnuit, his twin sister, born in the same way as he was born. This goddess, invented for the occasion, was never fully alive, and remained like Nephthys, a theological entity rather than a real person. The texts describe her as the pale reflex of her husband. Together with him she upholds the sky, and every morning receives the newborn sun as it emerges from the mountain of the east. She is a lioness when Shu is a lion, a woman when he is a man, a lioness-headed woman if he is a lion-headed man. She is angry when he is angry, appeased when he is appeased. She has no sanctuary wherein he is not worshipped. In short, the pair made one being in two bodies, or to use the Egyptian expression, one soul in its two twin bodies. Hence we see that the Heliopolitans proclaimed the creation to be the work of the sun-god, Atumu-Ra, and of the four pairs of deities who were descended from him. 
It was really a learned variant of the old doctrine that the universe was composed of a sky-god, Horus, supported by his four children and their four pillars. In fact, the four sons of the Heliopolitan cosmogony, Shu and Sibu, Osiris and Sit, were occasionally substituted for the four older gods of the houses of the world. This being premised, attention must be given to the important differences between the two systems. At the outset, instead of appearing contemporaneously upon the scene, the four children of Horus, the four Heliopolitan gods who were deduced one from another, and succeeded each other in the order of their birth. They had not that uniform attribute of a supporter, associating them always with one definite function, but each of them felt himself endowed with faculties and armed with special powers required by his condition. Ultimately they took to themselves goddesses, and thus the total number of beings working in different ways at the organization of the universe was brought up to nine. Hence they were called by the collective name of the Ennead, the Nine Gods, Pauit Nitiru, and the god at their head was entitled Pauiti, the god of the Ennead. When creation was completed, its continued existence was ensured by countless agencies with whose operation the persons of the Ennead were not at leisure to concern themselves, but had ordained auxiliaries to preside over each of the functions essential to the regular and continued working of all things. The theologians of Heliopolis selected eighteen from among the innumerable divinities of the feudal cults of Egypt, and of these they formed two secondary Aeneids, who were regarded as the offspring of the Aeneid of the creation. The first of the two secondary Aeneids, generally known as the minor Aeneid, recognized as chief Harsiesis, the son of Osiris. Harsiesis was originally an earth god who had avenged the assassination of his father and the banishment of his mother by Sit, that is, he had restored fullness to the Nile and fertility to the Delta. When Harsiesis was incorporated into the solar religions of Heliopolis, his filiation was left undisturbed as being a natural link between the two Aeneids, but his personality was brought into conformity with the new surroundings into which he was transplanted. He was identified with Ra through the intervention of the older Horus, Haoriris, Harmachis, and the minor Aeneid, like the great Aeneid, began with the sun god. This assimilation was not pushed so far as to invest the younger Horus with the same powers as his fictitious ancestor. He was the son of earth, the everyday sun, while Atumu Ra was still the sun, premundane and eternal. Our knowledge of the eight other deities of the minor Aeneid is very imperfect. We see only that these were the gods who chiefly protected the sun god against its enemies and helped it to follow his regular course. Thus Haruditi, the Horus of Edfu, spear in hand, pursues the hippopotami, or serpents, which haunt the celestial waters and menace the god. The progress of the sun-bark is controlled by the incantations of thought, while Ua Pua Itu, the dual jackal-god of Siuk, guides and occasionally tows it along the sky from south to north. The third Aeneid would seem to have included among its members Anubis the jackal, and the four funiary genii, the children of Horus, Hapi, Amsit, Tiumoft, Kabsonif. It further appears as though its office was the care and defense of the dead sun, the sun by night, as the second Aeneid had charge of the living sun. Its functions were so obscure and apparently so insignificant as compared with those exercised by the other Aeneids, that the theologians did not take the trouble either to represent it or to enumerate its persons. They invoked it as a whole, after the two others, in the formulas in which they called into play all the creative and preservative forces of the universe. But this was rather as a matter of conscience, and from love of precision than out of any true deference. At the initial impulse of the Lord of Heliopolis, the three combined Aeneids started the world and kept it going, and gods whom they had not incorporated were either enemies to be fought with, or mere attendants. The doctrine of the Heliopolitan Aeneid acquired an immediate and a lasting popularity. It presented such a clear scheme of creation, and one whose organization was so thoroughly in accordance with the spirit of tradition, that the various sacerdotal colleges adopted it one after another, accommodating it to the exigencies of local patriotism. Each placed its own nome god at the head of the Aeneid as the god of the Nine, the god of the first time, creator of heaven and earth, sovereign ruler of men and lord of all action. As there was the Aeneid of Atumu at Heliopolis, so there was that of Anhuri at Thinus and at Sebenidos, that of Minu at Coptos and at Panopolis, 
that of Hororis at Edfu, that of Sabku at Ambos, and later that of Ptah of Memphis and Ammon at Thebes. Nomes which worshipped a goddess had no scruples whatever in ascribing to her the part played by Atumu, and in crediting her with the spontaneous maternity of Shu and Tapnuit. Nit was the source and ruler of the Aeneid of Sais, Isis that of Buto, and Hathor that of Dendera. Few of the sacerdotal colleges went beyond the substitution of their own feudal gods for Atumu. Provided that the god of each nome held the rank of supreme lord, the rest mattered little, and the local theologians made no change in the order of the other agents of creation, their vanity being unhurt even by the lower offices assigned by the Heliopolitan tradition to such powers as Osiris, Sibu, and Sit, who were known and worshipped throughout the whole country. End of section 15 Chapter 2 The Gods of Egypt, Part 8 The theologians of Hermopolis alone decided to borrow the new system just as it stood, and in all its parts. Hermopolis had always been one of the ruling cities of Middle Egypt. Standing alone in the midst of the land lying between the eastern and western Mies, it had established upon each of the two great arms of the river a port and a custom house, where all boats traveling either up or down stream paid toll on passing. Not only the corn and natural products of the valley and of the delta, but also goods from distant parts of Africa brought to Siouf by Sudanese caravans helped to fill the treasury of Hermopolis. Thought, the god of the city, represented as ibis or baboon, was essentially a moon god, who measured time, counted the days, numbered the months, and recorded the years. Lunar divinities, as we know, are everywhere supposed to exercise the most varied powers. They command the mysterious forces of the universe, they know the sounds, words, and gestures by which these forces are put in motion, and not content with using them for their own benefit, they also teach to their worshippers the act of employing them. He had discovered the incantations which evoke and control the gods. He had transcribed the texts and noted the melodies of these incantations. He recited them with that true intonation, ma cruo, which renders them all powerful, and every one, whether god or man, to whom he imparted them, and whose voice he made true, sma cruo, became like himself master of the universe. He had established the creation not by muscular effort, to which the rest of the cosmogonical gods primarily owed their birth, but by means of formulas, or even of the voice alone, the first time when he awoke in the new. In fact, the articulate word and the voice were believed to be the most potent of creative forces, not remaining immaterial on issuing from the lips, but condensing, so to speak, into tangible substances, into bodies which were themselves animated by creative life and energy, into gods and goddesses who lived or created in their turn. By a very short phrase, Tumu had called forth the gods who order all things, for his come unto me, uttered with a loud voice upon the day of creation, had evoked the sun from within the lotus. Thought had opened his lips, and the voice which proceeded from him had been an entity. Sound had solidified into matter, and by a simple emission of voice the four gods who presided over the four houses of the world had come forth alive from his mouth, without bodily effort on his part, and without spoken evocation. Creation by the voice is almost as great a refinement of thought as the substitution of creation by the word for creation by muscular effort. In fact, sound bears the same relation to words that the whistle of a quartermaster bears to orders for the navigation of a ship transmitted by a speaking trumpet. It simplifies speech, reducing it, as it were, to a pure abstraction. At first it was believed that the Creator had made the world with a word, then that he had made it by sound but further conception of his having made it by thought does not seem to have occurred to the theologians. It was narrated at Hermopolis, and the legend was ultimately universally accepted, even by the Heliopolitans, that the separation of Nuit and Sibu had taken place at a certain spot on the side of the city where Sibu had ascended the mound on which the feudal temple was afterwards built, in order that he might better sustain the goddess and uphold the sky at the proper height. The conception of a creative council of five gods had so far prevailed at Hermopolis, that from this fact the city had received in remote antiquity the name of the House of Five. Its temple was called the Abode of Five, down to a late period in Egyptian history, and its prince, who was the hereditary high priest of thought, reckoned as the first of his official titles that of Great One of the House of Five. 
The four couples who had helped Atumu were identified with the four auxiliary gods of thought, and changed the Council of Five into a great Hermopolitan Aeneid, but at the cost of strange metamorphoses. However artificially they had been grouped about Atumu, they had all preserved such distinctive characteristics as prevented their being confounded one with another. When the universe which they had helped to build was finally seen to be the result of various operations demanding a considerable manifestation of physical energy, each god was required to preserve the individuality necessary for the production of such efforts as were expected of him. They could not have existed and carried on their work without conforming to the ordinary conditions of humanity, being born one of another, they were bound to have paired with living goddesses as capable of bringing forth their children as they were of begetting them. On the other hand, the four auxiliary gods of Hermopolis exercised but one means of action, the voice. Having themselves come forth from the master's mouth, it was by voice that they created and perpetuated the world. Apparently they could have done without goddesses, had marriage not been imposed upon them by their identification with the corresponding gods of the Heliopolitan Aeneid. At any rate, their wives had but a show of life, almost destitute of reality. As these four gods worked after the manner of their master, thought, so they also bore his form and reigned along with him as so many baboons. When associated with the lord of Hermopolis, the eight divinities of Heliopolis assumed the character and the appearance of the four Hermopolitan gods in whom they were merged. They were often represented as eight baboons surrounding the supreme baboon, or as four pairs of gods and goddesses, without either characteristic attributes or features, or finally, as four pairs of gods and goddesses, the gods being, as far as we are able to judge, the couple Nu Nuit, answers to Shu Tafnuit, Hahu Hehit to Sibu and Nuif, Kaku Kakit to Osiris and Isis, Ninu Ninit to Sit and Nephthys. There was seldom any occasion to invoke them separately. They were addressed collectively as the eight, Kumunu, and it was on their account that Hermopolis was named Kumunu, the city of the eight. Ultimately they were deprived of the little individual life still left to them, and were fused into a single being to whom the text refer as Kunuminu, the god eight. By degrees the Aeneid of thought was thus reduced to two terms, take part in the adoration of the kings, According to a custom common towards the Greco-Roman period, the sculptor has made the feet of his gods like jackals' heads. It was a way of realizing the well-known metaphor. It is a way of realizing the well-known metaphor which compares a rapid runner to the jackal roaming around Egypt. As the sacerdotal colleges had adopted the Heliopolitan doctrine, so they now generally adopted that of Hermopolis. Ammon, for instance, being made to preside indifferently over the eight baboons, and over the four independent couples of the primitive Aeneid. In both cases the process of adaption was absolutely identical, and none would have been attended by no difficulty whatever, had the divinities to whom it was applied only been without family. In that case the one needful change for each city would have been that of a single name in the Heliopolitan list, thus leaving the number of the Aeneid unaltered. But since these deities had been turned into triads, they could no longer be primarily regarded as simple units, to be combined with the elements of some one or other of the Aeneids without preliminary arrangement. The two companions whom each had chosen had to be adopted also, and the single thought, or single atumu, replaced by the three patrons of the nome, thus changing the traditional nine into eleven. Happily, the constitution of the triad lent itself to all these adaptations. We have seen that the father and the son became one and the same personage, whenever it was thought desirable. We also know that one of the two parents always so far predominated as almost to efface the other. Sometimes it was the goddess who disappeared behind her husband, sometimes it was the god whose existence merely served to account for the offspring of the goddess, and whose only title to his position consisted in the fact that he was her husband. Two personages thus closely connected were not long in blending into one, and were soon defined as being two faces, the masculine and the feminine aspects of a single being. On the other hand, the father was one with the son, and on the other he was one with the mother. Hence the mother was one with the son as with the father, and the three gods of the triad were resolved into one god in three persons. Thanks to this subterfuge, to put a triad at the head of an Aeneid was nothing more than a roundabout way of placing a single god there. The three persons only counted as one, and the eleven names only amounted to the nine canonical divinities. 
Thus the Theban Aeneid of Amun Mat Khonsu, Shu, Tachnuit, Sibu, Nuit, Osiris, Isis, Sit, and Nephthys, is, in spite of its apparent irregularity, as correct as the typical Aeneid itself. In such Aeneids Isis is duplicated by goddesses of like nature, such as Hathor, Selkit, Taninit, and yet remains but one, while Osiris brings in his son Horus, who gathers about himself all such gods as play the part of divine sun and other triads. The theologians had various methods of procedure for keeping the number of persons in an Aeneid at nine, no matter how many they might choose to embrace in it. Supernumeraries were thrown in like the shadows at Roman suppers, whom guests would bring without warning to their host, and whose presence made not the slightest difference either in the provision for the feast, or in the arrangements for those who had been formally invited. Thus remodeled at all points, the Aeneid of Heliopolis was readily adjustable to sacerdotal caprices, and even profited by the facilities which the triad afforded for its natural expansion. In time, the Heliopolitan version of the origin of Shu Tafnuit must have appeared too primitively barbarous. Allowing for the license of the Egyptians during Pharaonic times, the concept of the spontaneous emission whereby Aturnu had produced his twin children was characterized by a superfluity of coarseness, which it was at least unnecessary to employ, since by placing the god in a triad, this double birth could be duly explained in conformity with the ordinary laws of life. The solitary Aturnu of the more ancient dogma gives place to Aturnu the husband and father. He had, indeed, two wives, Iusuite and Nebthapit, but their individualities were so feebly marked that no one took the trouble to choose between them. Each passed as the mother of Shu and Tafnui. This system of combination, so puerile in its ingenuity, was fraught with the gravest consequences for the history of Egyptian religions. Shu, having been transformed into the divine son of the Heliopolitan triad, could henceforth be assimilated with the divine sons of all those triads, which took the place of Tumu at the head of provincial Aeneids. Thus we find that Horus, the son of Isis at Buto, Ari Hasnofir, the son of Nit at Sais, Kanumu, the son of Hathor at Esna, were each in turn identified with Shu, the son of Aturnu, and lost their individualities in his. Sooner or later this was bound to result in bringing all the triads closer together, and in their absorption into one another. Through constant reiteration of the statement that the divine sons of the triad were identical with Shu, as being in the second rank of the Aeneid, the idea arose that this was also the case in triads unconnected with Aeneids, in other terms, that the third person in any family of gods was everywhere and always Shu under a different name. It having been finally admitted in the sacerdotal colleges that Tumu and Shu, father and son, were one, all the divine sons were, therefore, identical with Tumu, the father of Shu, and as each divine son was one with his parents, it inevitably followed that these parents themselves were identical with Tumu. Reasoning in this way, Egyptians naturally tended towards that conception of the divine oneness to which the theory of the Hermopolitan Ogdoad was already leading them. In fact, they reached it, and the monuments show us that in comparatively early times, the theologians were busy uniting in a single person the prerogatives which their ancestors had ascribed to many different beings. But this conception of deity towards which their ideas were converging has nothing in common with the conception of the god of our modern religions and philosophies. No god of the Egyptians was ever spoken of simply as god. Tumu was the one and only god, Nutu u'au a'uiti, at Heliopolis. Anhuri Shu was also the one and only god at Sebenitos and at Thinis. The unity of Atunu did not interfere with that of Anhuri Shu, but each of these gods, although the sole deity in his own domain, ceased to be so in the domain of the other. The feudal spirit, always alert and jealous, prevented the higher dogma which was dimly apprehended in the temples from triumphing over local religions and extending over the whole land. Egypt had as many sole deities as she had large cities, or even important temples. She never accepted the idea of the sole god, beside whom there is none other. End of chapter 2 End of section 16